Committee on Parole is called back to order. The time is 1035. Our next case is going to be Miss Desi Tucker. Uh, Ms. Yes, Tucker, sir. please yes, give sir. us your full name and DOC number. Uh, my name is Desiree Tucker. My DOC number is 299274. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Tucker. Let me explain our process to you. Uh, first, I'm going to read some information into the record, and then the board is going to conduct a parole interview with you. At the appropriate time, we'll allow the participants who've indicated they wish to have their input to speak. Uh, here today, speaking on your behalf, is uh, Ms. Christy Sheremy with uh, the Louisiana Parole Project, your granddaughter, Ms. Leandra Tucker, uh, Dr. Sonia, who is also here speaking, uh, Ms. Uh, Catherine Matz, Mr. Ms. Rachel Epner, uh, your attorneys, uh, as well as Mr. Ivy Mathis, who will not be speaking. Uh, in opposition, we have Mr. Randy, Mr. Randy Myers, who is with the Jefferson Parish District Attorney's Office. Uh, at the end, uh, you'll be allowed to make a brief statement, uh, and then we'll hear from your lawyers, and then the board will vote. Do you understand our process? Yes, sir. This is the matter of Desi R. Tucker, VOC number 299274, date of birth, September the 26th of 1954. She's a first time, first class offender. She has a parole eligibility date of August the 1st of 2021, an adjusted good time date of January the 27th of 2039, full term date of 7-23 of 2089. Uh, she was originally sentenced to life for second degree murder. Her sentence was commuted to 99 years on October the 20th, 2022. Is all of that uh, fairly accurate, uh, Ms. Tucker? Yes, sir, it's accurate. Ms. Tucker, uh, your case has been assigned to me, so uh, I'm, I'm gonna be the one to begin the questioning. Ms. Tucker, uh, how old are you, ma'am? I'm 68 years old. Okay, and how long have you been in prison on these charges? 33 years, sir. Tell me a little bit about your educational background. How far did you go in school? On the street, I went as far as sixth grade. Okay. But about my, continue? Yes, ma'am, sorry. But upon my uh, arrival here at LCIW, I spent the uh, past 20, I spent 23 years in a GED program to get my GED. And did you get your GED? Yes, sir, I got it after 23 years. Terrific, yeah, good job. Thank you. That's persistence and very hard work. So. Thank you. Very good. Uh, Ms. Tucker, tell me a little bit about why you're in prison. Tell me what happened. Then. On July 25th, 1990, there was an altercation between Ms. Linda Taylor Johnson and myself. Now, did you know Ms. Johnson? Was she a friend, a relative, or what? Just say we were like near associates. We wasn't the best of friends. We weren't the enemies either. I can't tell you what went wrong, but anyway, it ended with me killing Ms. Johnson and me being arrested later. I apologize to this day and every day since it happened for my action. I didn't mean to take her life. Tell, tell me as best you can recall what happened. She was stabbed, is that right? Yes, she- How did it happen that you ended up stabbing her? She ran me down in a fence in lot with a baseball bat, sir. And when she caught up with me, I had to stop because I ran past a boy and I stopped and kneeled to the ground, turned around to pick it up, and she come down and crashed me in my head with that baseball bat. I then tried to swing the two by four that I retrieved from the ground at her, but the board was too wide for my hand. It went backwards. That allowed her the chance to come down on me again with the baseball bat that she was carrying to attack me with. 
I blocked that lick with my left hand and came out of my underwear with a knife that I carried on me. And that's what I'm led to me being arrested. I killed Tully. Uh, were you drinking at the time or were you doing drugs at all? I was drinking at the time, sir. And I occasionally smoked the weed too. Okay, but on this particular day, uh, July the 25th of 1990, were you drinking then? Yes, sir, I was drinking. What you had, what had you been drinking? Some beer. Um, how much you had to drink? Well, I can't give you an exact estimate, but I could have drank anywhere over a six, a six pack or less. Prior to the, the, the altercation, the stabbing, the baseball bat and such, what were you and Ms. Johnson doing together? How did you get with her? Well, we was all like sitting around drinking like a, a group of people, you know, they meet up in the neighborhood. And she been drinking as well? Excuse me, sir, could you repeat and that? Has, had Ms. Johnson been drinking as well? Yes, she'd been drinking and she was into more powerful drugs and alcohol than I was. Yeah. And so how long had y'all been together there drinking and doing whatever y'all were doing before this altercation started? Uh, the, we had been meeting up like that. No, no, on that particular day. That particular day. That particular day, we just met up. How long up had y'all been together drinking? Oh, uh, excuse me. Again, I need you to repeat that for me. I didn't get it. Okay. All right, what I'm, what I'm asking you is I'm more interested in the day this all happened. Were you and Ms. Johnson together with other people drinking? Yes, sir. How long had y'all been doing that before y'all got in an argument? Uh, we had been doing that for, uh, I'd say maybe uh, about a year or two. No, just a no, that on that evening, how long had y'all been together? On that evening, how long? Maybe about an hour or two. Okay. What was the argument about? So this day, I cannot tell you that there was an argument that took place between me and Ms. Johnson. There were a manipulator and a bunch of other people uh, uh, pushing, motivating her to do what she did. But it was me and another woman, I feel was going to get up and come behind me and do something to me. So I stopped and turned my back up against the vehicle. And Betty said something to Linda. Well, Linda had attacked me like a year before that happened, but I let that go because I didn't want to end up in prison or anything. I let that go. But Betty Jean Fuller Love was one of the people, the manipulator, who stopped Linda from being arrested that time. So I guess she figured that Linda owed her something. So she was playing on Linda's sympathy. And when I seen it mentally, mentally, I said to the manipulator, I said, it ain't gonna be like it was before. Now, I don't know if Linda thought that was preferred to her, but I didn't think nothing of it because I need nothing going to her because I never argued with her. Yes, did you stab her before she hit you with the baseball bat? No, sir. No, sir. No way. She hit me twice with a baseball bat before I come out my underwear with that knife. Now, you went you went to trial and you were found guilty of second degree murder. Yes, I was, sir. Uh, tell me a, a little bit about your drinking. Uh, you said you, you, I think you said you smoked a little weed and you drank. When did yeah. you start? When did you start smoking weed? How oh, I think, I think I started smoking weed 
uh, in the 70s, around the early 70s, I think. How, how often would you smoke? Well, you don't really get high off of it, so I smoked it like every day. And for how long did you do that? Well, like, let me try. Up until the time I got arrested. Yeah, so you pretty much smoked marijuana every day until this happened? Yes, sir. And you were drinking as well? Yes, sir. How often would you drink? Well, I didn't drink much, but I tried to get me a beer in every day. Did you ever have any sort of treatment for either drugs or alcohol or both? Me, no, sir. I've never had any kind of treatment uh, for uh, alcohol or drug abuse. I didn't really realize I had such problems until my arrest. And upon discovering that, I got treatment through NA and AA and substance abuse and living in balance. I tried to help oh, myself. You can we're going to talk about that in just a second. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk, let's talk a little bit about your, your past history. Uh, you've had 14 arrests. A lot of those arrests include alcohol, violence, weapons. Why, why, why the weapons? Why the violence? Why all of that? Are you angry? Were you angry back then? Uh, sir, I was not angry back then. I lived in a poverty neighborhood and I was a single parent. Everywhere I went, I had trouble because some people tried to even much bring me into a prostitution ring, were making me hustle men and stuff for them. I wasn't the type of woman that was gonna abandon my children. I know I'm not a perfect mother, but I did my best to maintain the safety of myself and my children. Yes, I hung with the wrong crowd. And yes, I did kill Linda Johnson. And I'm very sorry for what I did. But sir, I wasn't afraid of Miss Johnson. I was afraid of them, them dudes out there. Right, let, 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 me, let me finish, okay? Let's, let's keep moving forward, okay? You were convicted or pled guilty to negligent homicide. Uh, yeah. killed a young boy, uh, injured two children, three children. Were you drinking then or smoking dope then? Yes, sir. But I, I'm, I'm, you can answer. Wait, I can answer. Yeah. The previous week, given this. Right, I know. Sir, I'm sorry for the interruption, but. Oh. Uh, yes, alcohol was involved in all my arrests, sir. The negligent homicide was negligent homicide. It was a wreck. And what happened there? It was brought on by my little cousin. She was trying to prevent a boyfriend from going on. And she told me the keys, not me knowing exactly what was going on, and tell me to drive off with the car. Okay. Well, let me, let me say, yeah. Mr. Tucker? Yes, sir. You were, did you plead guilty or were you convicted? Because you got probation. What happened? Did you plead guilty or you were found guilty? Uh, I didn't go to trial, sir. You took a plead guilty. Yeah. You pled guilty to negligent homicide and you killed a small child, injured two others. And you tell me today you were drinking and smoking marijuana. You didn't do any kind of treatment on your probation. You weren't required to go to, to, to uh, AA meetings or get a substance abuse evaluation or anything like that. You didn't do anything back then. No judge required you to do that. I was only 17 years old. I, didn't well, I, I do understand that, but you were drinking, driving, and you killed somebody. The judge didn't make you put you on probation, didn't put you in prison. He didn't make you go or she didn't make you go to some sort of treatment to get alcohol treatment or drug treatment. 
No, sir. I was supervised by a probation officer, and that was all. Okay. Now let's talk about the programs that you've taken while you've been in prison. Okay, let's talk about substance abuse. Okay. Will you agree to me? I mean, you know, early on when I said drinking, and you said, well, I smoke a little weed. Smoking marijuana every day for 10 years, 15 years, whatever that was, that's more than smoking a little weed. And whether you think you get high or not, you do. Can we both agree that you're a drug addict? Yes, we can. Okay. So tell me what you have done since you've been in prison to address your drug addiction. You've taken Celebrate Recovery. What other programs have you taken? I've taken NA and AA. Um, when, you, when you say you've taken NA and AA, is that classes or did you actually go to meetings or what? I went to meetings and to classes because Celebrate Recovery is something like NA and AA to me and Life Healing Choices. I went to class and uh, Anger Management, NA and AA. I randomly go to these groups meetings. So that's just like a class to me. Well, let me ask you this. Oh, yeah. How do you, let's assume that, that you'll be getting out. Yes, How sir. will you stay sober? How will you stay away from marijuana? How will you stay away from drinking? Tell me what your plan is to stay sober by attending my NA and AA meetings regularly, staying away from people that do drugs and alcohol, not going into places like bars, a restaurant where alcohol may be sold. I have good coping skills. I'm gonna crochet, I'm gonna do canvas. I have things to occupy my time now that I'm away from drugs, I can do more reading. I, it's a, a whole new world for me. And let, I let can me, get a job. Let, let me ask you this. Since you've been in prison and you've had an opportunity to reflect on all of the years that you did drugs, smoked marijuana, drank a little bit, why did you do that? What, what motivated you to smoke the marijuana every day and to drink? a beer, at least a beer a day. What motivated you to do that? What was the reason for all of that? My upbringing, sir, the family that I was brought up in, there were more like more alcohol on the table than food. It was just a common thing for the adults to have this, to drink. I didn't, you know, really think that it would ever bother me. I did have a mind to try and be career-minded, to get from that, but nobody wanted to help me in the family to rise above that. And well, let, me, did, let, uh, let me ask you this. How long you were arrested in, in uh, what, when were you arrested? You've been in jail for uh, 33 years. 1990. I'm sorry? I was arrested 1990. in 1990. Okay, so for at least 15 years, you were doing drugs every day. Now, you weren't always home when you did that. I mean, was there some psychological reason? Did you want to get high? Were you depressed? Was life tough? What, what was the reason for you doing the drugs? I had gone through a, a broken marriage. Uh, my mother, she really didn't bring us up like a mother should, had a lot of free time on my hand to rip and run, be with people that do, did all minor things. Yeah. And when I had family members drinking, I, you know, I just picked up on the wrong things uh, for my environment. That's what made my life go down the hill. Well, now, a minute ago, you mentioned coping skills. What sort of coping skill? You mentioned crocheting and a few things like that. What What do you mean by coping skill? What, uh, what I meant by coping skills is find other alternatives 
than drinking. I put my, myself to doing something useful like crocheting, canvas, reading, crossword puzzles and stuff like that. I have other things that I can do to consume my time, to take up that space where I was addicted to alcohol and drugs. I don't need that no more. I have a better way of living. You've taken, uh, Vic, you, you wrote a victim letter. Uh, you did, you did. Uh, tell me what you would say to the family of the victim today if, if you had an opportunity to say something. I would say the same thing I said in that letter, that I'm very sorry for taking Linda's life. And I have searched my mind and my heart many times to try and come up with a way to give her back to her family, but it's something that I cannot do. Now you've had 15 write-ups since you've been in prison. You haven't had one since 2019. Did any of those write-ups include intoxication or drugs or alcohol? None of them, sir. I don't do drugs in prison. I don't do drugs in my life at all. Well, you did before you came to prison. I did before I came to prison. And there's but certainly drugs in prison. In prison. No, and I not. saved my life. I don't need that anymore. Now you have three children? Yes, sir. How old are your children? Uh, 53. 51. And 50. Do, do you have a relationship with your children? Yes, I have a relationship. It's not as tight as I want it to be, but I have one. And you communicate with them? Yes, sir, I do. Tell me about your transition plan. Tell me what, uh, what you would do if you were to get out. I, I know uh, you're, you're hoping to go to the parole project, so tell me what your understanding of that is. That my understanding about the parole project that I intend to go to will be able to help me continue my sorority with meetings in NA or AA. They will supervise my parole, something that I never really had nobody to do. And they will make available resources to me, help me to reiterate it back into the world because I have been gone 33 years and there's a lot of change out there. And I never want to get hurt and I never want to hurt anyone else again in life. I want to do my best. I want to show this board that they will not be making a mistake by giving me a second chance. I know in my heart, in my mind, that I'm a decent person. I fell on the wrong end. I'm willing to get up, put it behind me, and make the best out of my life, sir. Uh, I noticed. Uh... Ms. Tucker, that uh, you've done a lot of uh, faith-based studies. Uh, you've done a lot of ministry studies. What sort of things have you gotten out of that? Uh, did you have that basis before you came to prison? Is this something that you, 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 you learned and become since you've been in prison? I did not have the, the, the teaching like I said, I dropped out in the sixth grade. I didn't have a family to really help support me to the next level to be better than what I was in that environment. So I got stuck there. But coming to prison, I learned from the faith-based program that I can take and I can not only help myself, I can help other people by asking God to help me make these changes 
I see my life in a different way today. I see that the faith base and all the other religious service that I've gone into have brought me back to a time where I need to be in fellowship. Tell me about the Lifers Association. You're a member of the Lifers Association. Tell me what that is and tell me what, what how it's helped you while you've been in prison. I was a member of the Lifers Association till we disbanded about two years ago. Uh, that was like 26 years, 26 years. Our life is the association working for the change and rehabilitation. What we do is encourage each other to see God and to don't be afraid to come before a pardon board because of your crime. You have to start somewhere. And with the help of the Lord, to my faith, babes, I've learned that I could stand up, I could admit my wrong in front of this Spartan board or anybody else and take responsibility for my wrong. That's what I've learned in my faith, babes. I've also taken some vocational programs. You've taken... Uh... Uh, safety classes. Tell me a little bit about, about those programs that you take. Well, the safety classes I have taken, they will enable me to watch out for other people on the job as well as myself. Those tools are dangerous. <laughs> and you have to know how to handle these two in order to maintain safety. All jobs require, should, if they're not doing it, require these safety classes because they are good. They really are. And that's what I've learned from my safety class, the different, the different tools. What's the hammer to use for this? The, the, the wrenches, the screws, the Allen of screws, all kinds of stuff like that that would be helpful to any employee that would Plan on working to get out? Yes, I am. Kind of work. Your turn. <laughs> what kind of work do you want to do? Well, sir. I'm not as fit as I once was. I have Don't to take me your role because you're not. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to get there, but I feel like I've been beaten pretty well. I was, I was a painter for the institution. I have something called fibromyalgia. It does not prevent me from moving around because I won't allow nothing to keep me down. God just have to just take all the breath out of me. Because I'm a working woman, I'm going to get up and I'm going to do what I got to do. I need to survive and I do it the honest way. But I would like to apply a Walmart to be a greeter part-time. If I can't get that, I'll go somewhere else and apply. I'm not, I'm not that proud that I'm not too proud to crawl before I walk. So if I got to wash dishes or take out somebody's garbage in order to pay my parole fee or my rent, I'm going to do it. Doctor, what can you tell us about her medical condition? Oh, about, about fibromyalgia? Are you asking me, Dr. Stone? Yeah, does has she have yeah. any issues that we need to know about? She is fully physical functional, just um, has some has some difficulty with pain. I am a psychiatrist, but I'm familiar with fibromyalgia. So it's just a, a pain in, in your muscles and joints type of condition that's chronic. Warden, what can you tell us about Ms. Tucker? Ms. Tucker, um, obviously she said, you know, how long it took her to get her GED, but she was not willing to give up. Um, and she's not one to sit. Every time I walk into her housing unit, she's cleaning up behind somebody. So she's, you know, a hard worker and she, you know, is going to do what she needs to. 
she is minimum security level. And I mean, I think it says something for her since she's been with us, you know, over 30 years and she only has um, 15 disciplinary write-ups. And I think more than uh, almost half of those were um, schedule A's. So um, that's also, also something to note. I think Ms. Christie Jeremy will probably go into more specifics with the parole project, but um, you know, we are hopeful that she obviously would transition if she were to release today, just because she has been with us for so many years. Thank you, Warden. Appreciate it. Okay, now we'll hear from your supporters, uh, Ms. Shami. Again, Christy Jeremy with the Nijan Coral Project. Uh, please support. Uh, if Ms. Desi is granted today, uh, I will definitely be her caseworker. I've known Ms. Desi, of course, for over a couple decades. She and I also worked uh, together with the Life of the Association. Um, I watched her throughout those years. We determined to get her GED. We will provide her with all of the services she's, um, I would like, uh, if granted, to help Ms. Desi find a housing within the local area because she does qualify for 202 housing. And so. If granted, I would like to immediately start all of those um, programs throughout her reentry, no services throughout her reentry, and uh, get her on a waiting list. So, therefore, we um, hopefully get her to um, reside here in the Baton Rouge area. But we are definitely committed to providing colleges for as long as that it is needed. There is no exit date. We don't like to put a time frame on anybody, but um, we will individualize the it's a it's a case by case basis, of course. And um, in a AA meetings, anything uh, we, again, we have a social worker on staff who provide that um, evaluation for her. So I just want to know that it still stands. Thank you, Michelle. Any questions? Thank you, ma'am. Now we're here from uh, Ms. Leandra Tucker. Ms. Tucker, uh, with us? Yes, sir. Ms. Tucker, if you would introduce yourself and tell us what you'd like us to know about uh, the grandmother. Okay, I'm Leandra Tucker. I'm Miss Desi's oldest granddaughter. Um, thank you for taking time to hear my grandmother's case. I was two years old when my grandmother left. The last time I saw her in person was when I was 17, but I got to know her through phone calls. We speak on the phone every week and have been able to establish a deep connection, even though it was through the phone. My grandmother is a person full of positivity. It's surprising since she's been incarcerated for so long. Throughout my life, she has always been there for me. Again, even if our relationship has been strictly over the phone. I know deep down in my soul that my grandmother loves me no matter what. I am sad I missed opportunities to grow up with her. And I'm even more sad my two kids who are 16 and 14 are going through the same experience. My grandmother is loving and caring and she's someone that we deserve. At my grandmother's clemency hearing, my cousin Curtis spoke along with me. He was my grandmother's um, other grandson, and he died back in July of last year. This is my grandmother's second grandson who passed since she's been in prison. Both were sons of my auntie. And since then, my auntie has suffered so much with her health. It's declining, and she's really in bad shape. But it would mean so much if her mother was able to be with her. Also, I am scheduled to have surgery February 16th. And it would be wonderful if my grandmother could come home in time to be here for me, like I know she would. My grandmother is a natural caretaker, and it would mean so much to have her back home with her family. She has grandchildren that never even got the chance to meet her. She has plenty of great grandchildren who never got a chance to meet her. 
she's almost 69 years old. And even more important, maybe more than ever day, she is a part of our family and we can get to spend time with her outside the prison. If this board grants her parole, she has families to come home to and we will support her transition. Members of the board, please have mercy on my grandmother and please grant her parole. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, appreciate uh, your comments. Uh, now we'll hear from uh, Dr. Loretta Sonye. Yes. So um, I'm uh, Dr. Loretta Sonye, and I am a forensic psychiatrist. I have specialty or expertise in violence risk assessment. Um, and I was asked by um, Ms. Tucker's attorneys to evaluate her and, and talk to her about her childhood in um, circumstances that were present around the time of her arrest and, and um, also talk about her, her chance for success after um, if, where she be, if, if she gets paroled. Um, and I wrote a report uh, and I just wanted to uh, bring out one sentence and, and talk about that sentence after that I think is particularly important, okay? And so um, Ms. Tucker has gained an expanded awareness of life's possibilities and her values have changed. Um, I evaluated Ms. Tucker for about 90 minutes and reviewed all her records. And when I evaluated Ms. Tucker, she described an extraordinarily difficult childhood. Um, she did not have any caring adults in her life. And Ms. Tucker um, was neglected and she was immersed in adults who were fighting and were abusing substances. And um, there was no encouragement for Ms. Tucker to attend school or to have a different kind of life. And so at the time of her arrest, Ms. Tucker did not value her life. Um, she had very little to lose, and she abused drugs and alcohol as a primary way to cope and to reduce her stress. Um, prison has given Ms. Tucker a second chance. It's through all the programming, education, work, relationships that she's had at LCIW that she's become aware of what could be a good life. Um, and in prison, she's shown us if she sets her mind to something, she can accomplish it and she can do it. Mm -hmm. And now she has so many reasons and so many people to motivate her to remain sober. Um, she has important roles to play, including grandmother. And I just want to say she's a different person. She's a re rehabilitated and a healed person. And then I would gladly welcome her as my neighbor. Thank you, Doctor. We appreciate your comments. Uh, now we'll hear from uh, the opposition, Mr. Randy Meyer. Good morning, Mr. Meyer. Good morning, Randy Meyer, Assistant DA Jefferson Parish. Um, you know, Tucker's going to get out of jail one day, uh, and what my hope is is when that day occurs that she does not come back. Um, and I have some concerns about that happening if she is released today and, and following is the reasons why you, know, you look at her, her arrest record, lots of violence and weapons. Um, and she attributed a lot of that to substance abuse. Um, and, and she's been through some substance abuse. I, I'd like to see a long-term program, but that's something that I think the board can deal with, uh, a, a, sometime when she is released and require some some additional um, treatments um, and but what, what concerns me though is when you ask her about her plan when she gets out i liked her responses dealing with substance abuse she's going to continue to go to aa and na and work through those programs which which are very good and, and i think that'll help her significantly but what she didn't say anything about was anger and how she's going to deal with her anger um, when you look at her disciplinary reports and, and she's admitted that since she's been incarcerated, she's done no alcohol, no drugs. Um, all of her disciplinary reports have been for disobedience, aggravated disobedience, disrespect. Uh, she's had some programming as she's been incarcerated. 
Cage of Rage in 2017 and then Anger Management in 2018, I think, along with, with a, a pre-release programs. Um, and that was February of 2018 was Anger Management. But um, November of 2018, she had a disciplinary report for fighting. Then in December of 2019, she had a disciplinary report that when you read the report, she was having a loud argument with another inmate and the, and, and the uh, guards came in and separated them and stopped that going, stopped that from escalating to something worse. Um, you know, another one of our early disciplinary reports is a threat of violence. Um, so that concerns me. That, that's where my concern is. And, that, and, and I really think she needs some additional um, additional help with that to be able to cope with those things because she's still getting those disciplinary reports and she's not using alcohol and drugs. And then when you look back at her ACE, the ACE report, um, you know, everything, nine out of 10 of the questions, the answers were yes. Only one that's no dealt with, uh, was, a, was a household member depressed or mentally ill or attempt suicide. That's the only one that was no. And I don't see that there was sufficient programming in her file that dealt with all of those items on that age report. So, um, you know, I, I would love to see her have some more programming dealing with the anger issues and dealing with, with these issues that dealt, that, you know, involved with these, this age report prior to her being released. Because again, she's going to get out one day. And I just, I don't want her coming back. I don't want to, I don't want her being back in our office, um, you know, dealing with some, some violent event that occurred because she didn't get all of the programming that she needed while she was incarcerated. So today we're opposed for those reasons. Hey, I appreciate your comments. Uh, there's uh, Madison, there's Eppner, who is, uh, who is there? I can't see you. Sorry. Hi, nice to see you today. My name is Rachel Eppner. Um, I'm a student attorney, and I'm speaking on behalf of Ms. Tucker today. Thank you, Ms. Eppner. If you would, uh, tell us what you'd like us to know. So I'd like to start out with a quote, a quote written about Ms. Tucker by Ms. Tucker's peers, and we actually included 44 letters in the memo we submitted to you. So the quote goes, Ms. Tucker has encouraged me and uplifted me to know and believe that through God, anything is possible. Ms. Tucker has come before you today to apologize for what she has done. She's a different person, as you've heard from Dr. Sonia and from Ms. Tucker than she was 33 years ago. The facts of this case are tragic. In 1990, Ms. Tucker did kill Ms. Linda Taylor Johnson. In an unsent letter that the board mentioned today, Ms. Tucker wrote, I have prayed a billion times and I have wished day and night for God to show me a way to give Linda Taylor Johnson back her life or to show me a way to help ease y'all's heartache and pain. Providing a little bit of context about Ms. Tucker's life, I feel can answer some of the questions that you've asked today. Ms. Tucker was raised in an in an impoverished household, consistently surrounded by intoxicated, violent adults. Ms. Tucker has explained today that there was even more alcohol than food on the table. One way that she chose to escape this life was to marry someone at the age of 15, who was incredibly abusive to her. And by the age of 17, she already had three children. All this to say, Ms. Tucker, never had or never was taught any healthy coping skills for the trauma that she experienced. And she didn't have a whole healthy role models, adult role models to look to. So just as all of the adults in her life, she also turned to alcohol. She saw that that made them happy and she thought maybe that could do the same or at least provide some form of escape. Between 1971 and 1990, Ms. Tucker was arrested several times. Most of these charges were dismissed, yet, as Dr. Sonia noted in her report, that they reflected the chaotic environment Ms. Tucker found herself in and the way that alcohol impaired her judgment. 
Coming to LCIW, Ms. Tucker was provided the stability and order to learn how to cope. In her report, Dr. Sonia explains that Ms. Tucker learned how to tolerate stress and get along with others in prison. This is reflected in the fact that as y'all have mentioned today, that there are only 15 write-ups in more than three decades of incarceration. A board in LeBlanc at, her, at Ms. Tucker's pardon hearing noted that. The board and the DA have also mentioned today the 2018 write-up for fighting. At her clemency hearing, Ms. Tucker or Warden LeBlanc noted that this occurred during a high stress time after the flood. Ms. Tucker has acknowledged that she would have dealt with that situation differently, or she wishes that she dealt with that situation differently. And she's been practicing her anger management skills, like walking away from a situation, holding her breath for 10 minutes. And she now knows that she doesn't have to have the last word. This has been her only write up within the last 10 years. And other than this, she hasn't had one in 15. Dr. Sonia mentioned today that Ms. Tucker has shown remarkable rehabilitation and recovery while in prison. To further her recovery, Ms. Tucker will be attending and has been attending AA and NA meetings, which she has also participated in since 1997. With a brief hiatus during COVID, in addition to completing numerous substance abuse programming, and I'd also like to mention in the memo that we submitted to the board today, there are 64 different certificates. I'd like to mention that perhaps that is a lot of programming. And I know that I'm very, very proud of Ms. Tucker for completing all of them. And I also want to note that Ms. Tucker has actually pulled out right now that the 12 steps are always in her pocket, the 12 steps from, from AA. And each step is handwritten on separate pieces of paper. Her favorite step to review is number five. Okay. Admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being, the exact nature of our wrongs. Ms. Tucker said as soon as she admitted it to herself that she was free. One of Ms. Tucker's defining characteristics that you'll also know in the letters that we included is her perseverance and her commitment to accomplishing her goals. She was committed to getting her GED, even though it took her 23 years. And in 2015, she earned it. Assistant Warden Burke shared in a conversation with me and Professor Mattis that Ms. Dexy is a hard worker. Anything she sets her mind to, she gets done. Ms. Tucker has set her mind to remaining sober, and she has the skills and determination to accomplish just that. Dr. Sonia said here that Ms. Tucker has gained an expanded awareness of life pos life's possibilities and her values have changed since arriving to LCIW. At almost 69 years old, Ms. Tucker has spent the last 33 years learning and practicing the skills necessary to live a positive and productive life. Ms. Sheremy from LPP has described the robust reentry plan that's awaiting Ms. Tucker and a family that's ready to support and care. Every indication is that she's ready to rejoin her family and her community and we respectfully request and ask the board to grant her parole. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Hefner. Very good job. Uh, is there anything you'd like to add, uh, Ms. Tucker, before uh, the board votes? Sure. I had, uh, I have uh, a, a statement I want to say to the board, if I please. Mm -hmm. Ma'am. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to have my case before this board. I have a few notes I'd like to read. I want to apologize to Ms. Taylor's family for taking her life. I carry this grief and sadness with me every day. Even though I can't bring her back, I want her family to know I have worked in these past 32 years to be a better person than I was before I was arrested. For example, I worked for 23 years to get my GED. I attend AA and NA meetings for support to live an alcohol free. I found faith in God to help strengthen me to keep me changing. I have been motivated 
to do these things in Ms. Johnson's memory. Again, I apologize for taking Ms. Taylor's life. I want to continue my journey alcohol free and to use these new skills that I have gained to be a better person. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Tucker, the moderator. Ms. Tucker, uh, I, uh, I thoroughly enjoyed my interview with you. Uh, Thank you. I've really accomplished a lot of things uh, while uh, you've been in. You have gotten your GP after working for three years is, is uh, quite an accomplishment. Uh, you've got a very good transition plan. Uh, you've got a good sobriety plan. Uh, you have done well while you've been in prison. Uh, Dr. Sanjay's uh, discussion with us uh, helps explain uh, a little bit about who you were, who you are now. Uh, you've taken some uh, really good programs. Your risk assessment <laughs> is low. You do have a uh, uh, an issue on your knees. Uh, you've got a substance abuse issue. I think you've got a, a pretty good plan. Uh, Mr. Myers' uh, words and, and, and cautions have not been lost on you. Oh, I think I, I think that there's some some anger management issues that that you can can deal with. And I'm hoping that the Louisiana Parole Project, uh, I know they, they can get that treatment. Off, they can get those things for you. Uh, you've been in prison. 33 years, uh, and it looks like uh, the Department of Corrections, the prison system, has worked. Uh, one of the things that we want to see is that people better themselves while they've been there. I mean, your work with the Lifers Association, all of the statistics that you see, all of the things that you've done, my vote today would be to grant your parole uh, to the Louisiana Parole Project. Uh, I, I would ask the Parole Project, and I know that they would do this, uh, substance abuse evaluation, mental health evaluation, and I would like some concentration on anger management. There's some programs that uh, I'm sure they could uh, assist you with uh, that uh, would, would, would help that. Uh, I'd also like uh, you to go to three AA meetings uh, per week uh, when uh, you are released. That was my vote. I'm only one of three. So, Ms. Wise? All right. Uh, Ms. Tucker, I, uh, I just want to commend your granddaughter for participating today. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. She did a good job. I know she was scared, but she did a good job. Uh, I like what I heard today. The, go the governor signed your clemency uh, in October of last year. So you, you've been, you know, you um, You've been waiting for this day and you prepared and presented well today. I know you were nervous, but you prepared and you presented well. I concur with my colleague. My vote is to grant as well for the reasons I already stated on the record. I do want to state that uh, Base Parole was able to reach uh, Linda's family, Ms. Johnson's family. Uh, they talked with her son and he said he has forgiven you. I want you to take that. That's all. Thank you, Ms. Wise. Uh, I concur with my colleague. I also vote to grant with the same special condition. Ms. Tucker, parole has been granted today. What do you remember? Thank you. <laughs> Um, I have to say, I was I uh, I was feeling one way at the beginning, but after reading the court documents and going through this, it, I uh, I was converted to being very happy for her, and that looked totally authentic and genuine when she heard that the victim's son had forgiven her. Because we have seen where news like that had been passed on, and there was basically even no reaction. I'll read to you the court docket because I question if she should have ever gotten life to begin with, I really do. 
Um, I mean, when you hear about the child that she killed in the car, in the car, like that's the part that kept getting to me. But I know that we can't, you know, we can't harp on that. That's um, that's just not the way it works, right? Um, it's just, I guess, just a crazy, you know, the idea that she killed two people in her life. I know they're not at all connected, but, um, you know, and then another, another thing I'll just bring up before we read that is like, why do the district attorneys keep showing up for these type of cases? You know, it really seems like the student lawyer beat the district attorney. Uh, I just don't get it. They, they don't show up to the monster cases. Well, they sometimes do, but they not all of them. And he shows up to this, and he starts saying she should be locked up still because, well, she had a write-up in 2018 and a write-up in uh, 2015 or, you know, and it was, and it's like, yeah, 2018 was five years ago. And like that's one write up, and like the the, the student attorney said, it was um, only fifteen write ups in thirty three years, and, uh, and and excluding that one write up, it was one in fifteen years. So here's the thing: she got she got a life sentence without the possibility for parole, and. She got her life sentence commuted by by the parole board or by the pardons board in April 12th of 2021. Then October 20th, the governor uh, signed off on it. And then now she had her official parole hearing. But she was given a life sentence. Now listen to, here's the, the details of the crime. So she was convicted in on July 25th, 1990 of second degree murder and given life without parole. Um, so here's the, the details from, there were four eyewitnesses. On the evening in question that were brought up to testify, on the evening in question, approximately a dozen people had gathered on the vacant lot. Tucker arrived on her bicycle and immediately began to argue with full love. And then when Johnson, full love, said that Tucker was loud and had been drinking very much, Tucker armed with a knife circled behind Johnson who was seated. Full love said, Linda told her, get away from me, Desi Ray. Don't start with me. Tucker and Johnson had had a previous fight approximately a year earlier. A year earlier, they had a fight. Johnson had cut Tucker with a broken soft bottle drink. So Johnson, I guess the victim, had cut Tucker with a broken soft bottle drink. Back when soft bottle drinks were made of glass and not plastic. On the night of the fatal knifing, Tucker kept calling Johnson obscene names. Someone identified as Dookie handed Johnson a sheetrock knife, but she handed it back, saying she didn't want it. Taylor testified that Tucker told Johnson, well said, well, you have got me once, but you ain't gonna get me this time. I will kill your ass. Donaldson testified that Johnson tried to avoid Tucker, but that Tucker was intoxicated and mad. Donaldson said that she, Tucker, and had the anos uh, had this animosity in her heart, like she had a vendetta. She just wouldn't go home. They asked her to go home. So these are the witnesses that are saying, you know, she's the, she was angry, she was had a vendetta. So someone gave Johnson a baseball bat. So Johnson again is the victim. Someone gave. Johnson a baseball bat. Supposedly, the state contends to protect herself with. So someone gave her a baseball bat, and the state said that they gave her a baseball bat to protect herself from Tucker. But she still had a baseball bat. And a fight ensued. Addition to the knife, Tucker had the two-by-four piece of lumber, 
with the nail, which she spoke about. Um, Johnson hit Tucker in the head with the bat. So this is, this is, I guess what we could have just jumped right to. Johnson, the victim, hit Tucker in the head with a bat. Tucker dropped the two by four, but she cut and stabbed Johnson with the knife. Tucker was then they say Tucker was described as big and tough, and Johnson was much smaller. She was to quote slim, skinny, a little thing, legs, little bitty girl. Then fully loved Taylor Donaldson and Clark all said that Tucker. They said that the witnesses said that Tucker stood over the fallen Johnson and said, "I hope you die. I hope you die." Um, another witness said that Johnson struck Tucker with the bat, but the stronger Tucker took the bat away and then started swinging the knife at Johnson. So in, in all the scenarios, she was swung at and hit by the bat. And they basically said no, like the judge said, a person who is the aggressor or who brings on difficulty cannot claim the right of self-defense unless he was withdrawn from the conflict in good faith in such manner adversary knows to withdraw from conflict. Okay, so what they're saying, like what the judge said is, no, 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 she showed up as the aggressor. The other person had the bat and was defending herself. And then I just, I just don't like, you, you with all the uncertainty and all of this to give someone a life sentence without parole seems totally, totally bizarre, archaic, um, unjust. I mean, there, there, there are witnesses that she, even if she started off as the aggressor, the other person had a bat and hit her with it. And um, I'm not saying that she was an angel and that she should have even gotten away scot-free, but to get the idea that she got a life sentence without the possibility of parole is pretty bizarre. And maybe the judge saw her prior record and that's why he did it. Who knows what the reason is, but um, th th this is part of the reason why I'm just like, yeah, I'm, I'm... she's almost 69 years old. I mean, I, I do, I, I do, kind of, I do get what the prosecutor was saying, like, in the sense that, you know, if she gets in another fight on the outside, she's going to get locked back up, and she kind of does have this, um, and maybe I'm just wrong, I'm just one person, but almost like an energy of, like, maybe she won't take BS, and maybe she will get into a fight, but it's not fair to judge energy if she has a proven track record that she hasn't, so. I mean, she got through all the stress of COVID without getting into a fight. So I just, you know, she's the, she's earned her freedom, in my opinion. And we can't look at her car accident. I know that's terrible. And that's what really got me at the beginning, where I was kind of just like, no, I'm not going to. But no, she won me over. She was 15 when she got married. Can you imagine? And she had three kids by the time she was 17. Is that even possible? 15, 16, 17. Yeah, it is. And um, That was interesting that she had the all of the 12 steps written on those cards. That was, um, I haven't seen that before. But uh, I don't know, what do you think? I, I still can't get over that the prosecutor shows up for these things. It's like, come on. And if you're gonna show up for this, show up for the stuff that really, really stings. Show up for the real monsters. What were you? What was she gonna do? She's turning sixty-nine. 
she needs more classes really because she has because she has 15 write-ups in 33 years so what more does she have to prove i just come on makes me sick what do you guys think Frankly, I don't think she should have gotten a life sentence. But uh, anyways, with that, I'll let you go.